I am Carlo Bustos, Educational Programs Leader at Proformative, the online community for corporate finance, accounting, treasury, and related professionals. I would like to welcome everyone to today's webinar, Seven Deadly Sins of Internal Audit. Do you know how to avoid the major pitfalls that can derail an internal audit function? Too many internal audit departments are held back by focusing on things that don't matter instead of what really counts. In the face of growing regulatory pressure for public and private companies to become more transparent and disclose material information, the internal audit team will need to elevate their position within the business. Today you will learn how to help and collaborate with your department on how to avoid these traps and make them an advantage in your business. First, I'd like to welcome you back to Proformative. Just a brief overview on Hope Proformative for those of you who may be new to our community. We are the largest growing online community of finance, treasury, accounting, and related professionals. We are an ad-free, noise-free community where we encourage and expect peer-to-peer -peer collaboration. Check it out at proformative.com. And now just a few event notes before we do get started today. The link to today's presentation and the link to the recording of this webinar will be sent out to all attendees within 24 hours of the event. And the presentation is already posted on proformative.com slash resources for you to download and follow along. For those of you who would like to receive CPE credits, you will need to answer all three polling questions during the event and should have pre-registered for it. For any questions on CPE credits, please contact Chris Brower at proformative.com. We encourage everyone to ask questions throughout the webinar today, and we will have a Q&A session at the end. We ask you to leverage your questions box within your GoToWebinar control panel, and we will do our best to get to all of your questions. For whatever reason we do not, we will work with our speaker today and make sure we follow up with you directly after the event. And lastly, you will be asked to take a short survey today regarding today's webinar, and we greatly appreciate your feedback regarding this event, as we always strive to improve the ROI we offer to our attendees for your valuable time. And now just a brief overview on the learning objectives. After participating in the event, you will be able to understand and refocus on issues of critical concern to your management and audit committee, as well as learn how to avoid losing credibility and discover on how having an internal audit team is seen as a strategic asset to the business. Okay, let's get started. I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Michael Bashara, Managing Director of Granite Consulting Group, Incorporated. Michael has extensive financial management experience in corporate headquarter environments and has worked in the manufacturing, financial services, consumer goods, and defense industries. In his current role as Managing Director, Michael advises clients on profitability issues, risk assessments, accounting issues, and post-merger integration issues. Recent client success stories have come in from the form of greater profitability and transfer of te technical knowledge to the client. Prior to Granite, Michael was Chief Audit Executive in the defense and aerospace in industry. In this capacity, Michael oversaw risk-based audits, government compliance reviews, and Sarbanes-Oxley compliance. Michael was also actively involved in advising the board of directors on corporate governance matters and was appointed to several senior management committees, i.e. export compliance, review and disclosures, etc. Michael's prior experience includes working at the Pepsi Bottling Group and Daimler AG, where he accumulated diverse experience in fraud investigation, acquisition, and risk management. The floor is yours, Michael. Why are we discussing the seven deadly sins of internal audit? We are internal audit. After all, do we, uh, do we commit sins from time to time? Well, I think that the reason that we want to discuss this topic is because we actually have a very unique job. There is no other position within a corporation that has the uniqueness and the, the special uh, responsibilities that internal audit has. Not the corporate controller not the treasurer, not the director of tax. Internal audit itself is extremely unique, both because we are at once inside the company and independent from management. 
And because of that uniqueness, the skills required for success are very different from the other functions. And many people have asked the question, and I, I myself have continued to ask the question, what exactly is the secret sauce? What exactly is the secret ingredient for success in internal audit? Some have tried to answer this question with uh, technical skills. They say, you know, the best internal auditor is going to be the best accountant, the best finance guy, the one that, that knows this industry inside and out, along with all of the regulatory requirements. Other people disagree, and they say it's soft skills. The ability to manage employees and get the best out of them. The ability to project the professional image, or maybe it's just that your boss likes you. That's the reason for your success in internal audit. What we found is that it's neither of these. We've developed a concept called value and fit that we believe best explains the, uh, the drivers of success in internal audit. And value and fit means understanding the value of internal audit. In other words, what positive benefit do we generate for our organization, as well as how this fits in with our particular organization. So two steps generate a positive benefit and be able to integrate that positive benefit into your organization. Going a little deeper into value and fit. By value, the, the primary driver, the primary driver of our, of our uh, bringing of, of benefits to the company is going to be an understanding of risk. We are risk and, and control experts. The other value that a good internal audit function will bring to a company is an ability to absorb information quickly. People that have been in internal audit for some time know that you're never going to be an expert in every area you're charged with auditing. It's, it's not going to happen. Uh, and it probably shouldn't happen for various other reasons. But what needs to happen is you need to have a high degree of intellectual agility and that means being able to go into a certain area and quickly understand and grasp what the drivers of the business are and what the risks are to those drivers. And finally, all of this would mean nothing if we weren't able to translate all of that knowledge into practical business solutions that can be implemented in the here and the now, rather than theoretical constructs that are of limited value. By fit, we need to realize as internal auditors that any solution that we bring to the table has costs and benefits associated with it. Secondly, we need to realize that in a given business problem, there are many solutions. And we need to pick the one that's best for the particular situation and our particular organization. And finally, part of of the concept of fit is being able to gain the confidence of others and have them believe in our independence and in our credibility. Because the best solution won't mean much if somebody simply doesn't trust you enough to implement it. So with that, we're going to discuss the seven behaviors that threaten our concept of value and fit. And for uh, you know, colloquial terms, we've deemed these the seven deadly sins of internal audit, but they are nothing more than seven negative behaviors that tend to erode the, the key to success in internal audit, which we've defined as value and fit. Starting with the first sin, which is ineffective planning. And I'm just going to scroll a little bit here so all the animations appear on the, on the slide at once. In front of you, you have a triangle that lists out all of, the, uh, all of the detailed functions and tasks of an internal audit function. We arrange them into strategic, operational, and tactical. And right away, you can see that the strategic part of the job is, in fact, doing a risk assessment and putting together an audit plan. And by looking at this graphic, you can also quickly see that if you don't put a, a solid audit plan together, nothing you do after that, and I'll say that again, nothing that you do after that will matter at all because you failed from the beginning. You can have the most accurate budgets, 
the most amazing staff, the most cutting edge technology. Your work papers could look great and your audit reports can be extremely well written, but none of that is going to matter if you've chosen to audit the wrong things. Or, said another way, if you begin to audit in an area that uh, that's just not that risky to the company. So now that we've defined uh, audit planning as a very critical strategic function for internal audit, we should discuss what are the elements of a good internal audit plan. A good internal audit plan typically has three elements. The first is that it's based upon risk. The second is that it has multiple sources of input. And the third is that it uses some technology to support the process, now, whatever the, that that technology is. Certainly, you know, in a smaller environment, it can range from Microsoft Excel. In a larger environment, there are some, some audit planning packages and automated work paper programs that can assist you. But the most important element here is that the plan is risk-based. And let's find out why. Well, Joel Kramer, who many of you know from the MIS Training Institute, says it pretty good. Internal audit must concentrate on inherent and residual high risks and remove low risks off the audit plans. But why is that? Well, think about it. If the audit plan is not based upon risk, then what is it based on? It could be based upon some sort of rotational schedule. So the, the head of internal audit could say, you know, we're going to go out and we're going to audit every business unit every three years could be based upon our own gut feelings or suspicions within the internal audit function, or we can simply take management requests and, and go do what management tells us to do. But all three of these aren't really good alternatives, are they? Because an effective risk assessment is going to tell us what area of the organization to audit. And I'm going to share a case study that's going to illustrate why there really are no alternatives to doing that. We worked with a, uh, a large multinational consumer products company. And the head of internal audit said, we're going to develop a rotational internal audit plan, and we're going to go out and audit each operating unit once every three years. So they embarked upon this rotational schedule. And after a year or so, it became pretty clear that the whole system was breaking down and it wasn't working. Why? Well, primarily because the head of internal audit was always in front of the audit committee trying to explain to senior management and the audit committee why exactly his auditors were over at unit A, which was a pretty clean unit where, you know, it's very well controlled, not a lot of past history of control problems, and in fact, they were pretty clean in the current year, while unit D, well, was sort of on fire from a risk and control perspective. So he's always kind of answering the question, why are you here and not there? The second thing that, uh, that happened was, as a result of having to answer these questions, he was constantly rearranging his rotational internal audit schedule and constantly reallocating resources towards where the fires were. And I think this, uh, the moral of this story was, at the end of the day, even though he set out to have a very simple approach and say, you know, we're going to audit each unit once every three years, you end up auditing by risk anyway because you're forced into it due to business requirements and due to the demands of, of those whom you serve, the audit committee and, and senior management to an extent. The next risk is being self-centered. You know, every function within a company thinks they are doing the most important work. If you talk to sales and marketing, they believe the company would never book another sale without them. Operations believe that they're the only function within the company that's even necessary. And the finance people think that if they walked out of the door and never came back, the company would be bankrupt in a day or two. Internal auditors, unfortunately, are no stranger to this conceit. Some of us in internal audit believe that processes and controls are the company rather than a part of the company. And I have some data to back this up. There's a Forbes Global Insight survey that tells us that 44% of respondents believe that internal audit is helping their organization achieve its business objectives 
And an even smaller minority, 37%, say they involve internal audit in key business decisions and strategy. If we want a seat at the table, you know, the, the Institute of Internal Auditors and many chief audit executives are always saying how they want internal audit to be more strategic, to be more proactive, to be more involved in the higher level discussions that are going on in the company. If we want to be involved in those discussions, and as I said, have a seat at the table, we're going to have to understand how we fit in with the company. We have to understand that good risks, or sorry, good controls and effectively identifying risk is a, uh, a critical function that needs to occur, occur at the company, but it's not the reason for the company's existence. Now I'll pause here. And, and just relay some of the feedback that we often get from, from internal auditors, which is, we're frustrated. We always want to fight the good fight, and we want to communicate to management and tell them how important risks and controls are, but nobody wants to listen. And when we talk to audit committee members, that's, that's not really the message that we get. What we get is, you know, we are interested in risk assessment and putting in place good controls, but we want expert advice. We want risk and control experts that can help us incorporate this, this critical function, these critical processes within our company. And they really do value good opinions. What they don't value are utopian answers or textbook answers that really don't make sense for their particular situation. So to be able to do this and to be able to contribute here, you need to understand the organization's objectives, including the economic risks. We need to make sure that our solutions when it comes to risks and controls support the organization's objectives and they meet the cost benefit test. And in specific, we need to be more logical and pragmatic than I think internal audit has been in the past. There are many ways to solve internal audit issues, and we need to be advisors and facilitators in guiding management and the audit committee on the right path to be able to identify the specific solution that's going to work for uh, your, your organization's environment. The second case study here is actually, number one, it's a, obviously a true story. Number two, it's if you're into gallows humor, I think the, uh, you know, the, the darkness of the, the comedy here will, <laughs> will pique your interest. But a long time ago, I, uh, I sat in an audit closing meeting for a global financial services company. And this company had a well-established internal audit function. Many of the staff had been in their positions for a long time. And the internal audit function had a very, very bad reputation within the company, very negative reputation. And we're about to see why. So it was an IT audit. And the, uh, the head of IT security was discussing with the audit manager some security issues, some security control breakdowns that needed to be mitigated. There, there needed to be some fixes put in place. And you know, the head of IT security was OK with the fact that, uh, that there were some process breakdowns that he needed to deal with. But he, he kind of finally asked the question, OK, so what's your recommendation on what needs to be done here? And the audit manager kind of looked at him and said, well, you really need to build a new data center. And the, the IT manager was, was flabbergasted, to say the least. And he, he kind of put down his pencil, leaned back in his chair, and said, OK, but can I even do what you are suggesting? Is there a budget for it? Will management approve it? Does it even contribute to the ROI of this company to go out and build a new data center? And all the internal audit manager could say was, well, no, but it would be the best solution. I think we can all forecast what the, uh, the IT manager's opinion of internal audit was after this meeting. Carlo, I think I'll pause at this point for the polling question. Thank you, Rob, Michael, and uh, this will bring us to our first of three polling questions, and everyone should be seeing this on uh, your screens here uh, momentarily. And we're just going to go ahead and um, 
just a small reminder for those of you who are attending today's webinar for CPE credit, you must take all three polling questions to receive full credit. But we urge all participants to answer the polling questions as it is statistical in nature and we will be sharing the results with you shortly here um, once we close up this polling question. At this time, I also want to remind you to ask questions within your questions box in your GoToWebinar panel and uh, we will definitely leverage those as we go throughout Michael's presentation here. And I'll give everyone about another 10 seconds. And Michael, while I leave everyone kind of um, wrapping up their thoughts here, we did have a comment come through. And, uh, you know, they, they did say, one of, the, one of the members of the audience is just kind of stating, you know, while they, the risk is a high value reason to audit, you know, process efficiency and effectiveness is also important. Um, they typically do not rate efficiency in the risk assessment as a risk similar to legal regulatory compliance. So any thoughts around how they can incorporate that into their process? Well, I, I'll answer the question in two parts. The first is it absolutely should be included. Uh, when, we, when we talk about risk, at least in the broader sense, from an internal audit planning perspective, we're talking about anything that's going to threaten the attainment of the organization's objectives. So we need to understand what the objectives are. If it's to launch a new product, gain market share this year, uh, maybe they had some misstatements last year, so a goal is to, to, to really beef up their financial reporting this year, their accuracy. Efficiency is, is, is always a risk. It's always a threat because if you're not doing something efficiently, uh, well, then you're really not doing it in the best way possible. You're sort of... Uh, you're sort of creating a drag on attaining uh, an organization's objectives, especially if that objective is time sensitive, as many of the uh, well, as many of the objectives that I just mentioned are, in fact. So, number one, it should be included. Number two, as to how it should be included, I think that's a broader question uh, uh, that really gets to how do we assess risk within a within an organizational environment, and that, that's probably not something that I can answer in a in, in a 30-second soundbite here, but uh, you know, clearly there are risk workshops that we can do. There is software out there that can help you assess risks. There, there, tra there's the traditional audit universe where you can map out all of the areas that are to audit within the organization and, and apply risk factors against them. So there's a number of ways we can do that. Fantastic, and uh, I appreciate that, Michael. And uh, for that audience member, you will have a chance to uh, ask for an introduction to Michael uh, in our post-event uh, survey. And as I'm saying this, Michael, I just want to share with you and, and the audience the uh, results from uh, the first polling question. And just give me your, your kind of initial thoughts. Is, does this kind of resonate with you or what you're seeing, or is this kind of a very different kind of uh, outcome for, for this particular uh, question? I think... Uh one of these answers is predictable. One of the, one of these answers is, uh, I guess, also predictable, but but more troubling. The top vote getter was rapidly changing business conditions, and I, I'm sort of glad to see that as the top vote getter because it is, in fact, the biggest challenge. Uh, you know, when you put together an audit plan, you're doing it as of a point in time, and business changes very, very rapidly, especially in in, in today's world. And yeah, one of the big challenges is going to be keeping your internal audit plan relevant, trying to update it so it doesn't become static and obsolete after only a few months. Uh, only one percentage point behind is audit does not have enough understanding of the business. Uh, troubling, but sadly I think it's probably true in a lot of cases. The good news there is that's something that we can attack. That's something that we can do something about. And there are a number of actions a chief audit executive or, or a, a second in command could take to make sure that that his, his audit staff really understands what's driving the business. Sounds great. I, I really appreciate you sharing that, uh, that insight with us, Michael, and just moving us along in the uh, interest of time. Sure. Uh, I'll let you uh, have the floor back. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Uh, the third sin is losing the truth. So it's not that we're calling anybody liars in, in this case, but, you know, we, we are in a... Uh, Getting back to my, my preamble before we started the, the meat of the presentation, we have a difficult job. We have a very unique job. Uh, a lot of our job involves uncovering the truth, separating fact from fiction, separating fact from, from opinion. Excuse me. So what is the problem here? The problem is that the 
we deal with a lot of complex issues, and the, the road from initially identifying a problem to reaching a final res resolution on that problem is often a very long, winding, and circuitous path. And the danger here is making a judgment call too early in the process and refusing to change our opinion through some fear of losing credibility. So what I mean here is, is what might seem a trivial issue at the beginning of an audit may turn out to be a very serious issue by the end of the audit, and vice versa. What seems very serious at the beginning of an audit could turn out to be, well, maybe just a verbal comment or nothing, in fact, by the end of the audit. And the danger here, as I mentioned, is to, uh, is to avoid getting wrapped up in our own emotions. Avoid making a, uh, a judgment call too early in the process and, uh, and not letting go of our position. In short, becoming married to our position. And the case study here is the auditor's last to know. So an operating unit of a major aerospace company uh, released an accounting reserve, causing a significant rise in net income. So, okay, red flag, they release a reserve, it bumps up net income, and lo and behold, the unit makes their numbers for the quarter. There's an internal audit going on, and the auditor asks the controller, hey, why'd you release this reserve? And the controller very angrily says, I don't know, and I don't have any documentation. Leave me alone. So the auditor staff auditor dutifully writes up the issue in the audit report as there was a reserve released and there's no support for that reserve being released at all. Uh, later on, the unit president calls and he provides to the internal audit manager detailed time-stamped documentation of the many meetings and discussions that went into releasing this particular reserve. And unfortunately, uh, the audit manager took a hard stance, a false hard stance, a foolish hard stance, and said, you know what, despite all the documentation uh, that you're able to provide, your controller said he didn't have anything, and so we're not changing the internal audit report. Well, unfortunately, this ended in disaster, but I, I think it's really sad because there actually was an internal audit issue here. There was an internal audit issue, but it wasn't the issue that internal audit wrote in the audit report. The real issue here was that there was support for releasing the reserve. It was discussed uh, exhaustively, and it was documented effectively. Unfortunately, the unit president and controller really didn't get along, so the unit president just cut the controller out of all the discussions, which is why the controller reacted very angrily to the staff internal auditor. The way this, this issue was written up was, as we see on the screen be, uh, before us. So the wrong audit report said management reserves were released without discussion, reasoning, or documentation. And management is not able to explain the logic or anything else about this. The way this issue should have been written up and what the true internal audit issue is that support for releasing the reserve is not maintained with accounting, and the controller wasn't involved. And that's really wrong, that you release the reserve without the input of the controller. So this, uh, this concept of losing the truth is, uh, is really about making sure that we really understand what we're talking about and we truly identify the, uh, the issues that, that need to be elevated in an audit report. Ineffective communication. So communication gets a, gets a lot of press uh, across functions in a company, but it's, it's pretty critical in internal audit. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to focus on board and executive communication here. And the reason why I'd like to do that is because as internal auditors, we are really, really good at communicating detail. We're very facile with the facts. We understand the, the detailed information very, very well, and we want to share that with people. We love other people to know just as much about this subject as we know, because we want to give them that benefit. Unfortunately, when communicating with the higher-ups in an organization, that's not always the best course of action. 
So the common fallacy amongst internal auditors sometimes is that the more information, the better. And on the other end of the, the communication continuum here, the executives and the board are really looking for expert advice, not for someone to throw reams of data at them. Communicating in a high amount of detail sends three negative messages. The first is, I have no insight, Mr. Board Member, Mr. Audit Committee Member, Mr. CEO, Mr. CFO. Here is all of this data. You make sense out of it because I'm unable to distill it. The second negative message is, you know what, I want to avoid blame. I'm going to give you everything that I know so you can't come back to me later and say that I didn't tell you something. And perhaps the most damaging message that we're sending is, you know, I need your detailed supervision and input to be able to manage my function correctly and effectively. These aren't messages that we want to be sending as internal auditors. There is a temptation here. And the temptation here is that data today, especially with the cloud and computers and everything else, data is cheap and you can communicate lots of data very, very easily. What we need to do is understand what's important to the audience and get, get the heart of the matter to them in business terms and not auditor speak. And I'd like to share with you some tools that I've developed throughout my career to be able to do this, which is on the, the bottom half of the screen here. The first thing, first rule of thumb, and I have that in red, in red font there, is to consolidate issues. If we have three or four audit issues that are around the common theme, don't report three or four issues to the higher-ups. Report one common theme, and you can give some examples based on that. And then I have points one, two, three, and four on the bottom there. And this is my, uh, my little formula here that I like to use for communicating audit issues. The first is get to the point of the newspaper headline. So an example of that would be there was a $400,000 fraud at Unit A. Boom, it gets it out there. You have everybody's attention. They know that, OK, we have a fraud. It's at Unit A, and it was about $400,000. The second is develop a thesis for why this condition exists. This fraud occurred due to collusion between the treasurer and the controller. OK, now they know what happened and, and a thesis for why it happened. And now we back that up with selected data. Fraud occurred through four separate transactions or tranches of about $100,000 apiece. And they occurred in March, July, September, and December of last year. And this is the critical point. At this point, stop. As hard as that, that may be. Just stop. Wait. Wait to hear. Now that they know what happened, why it happened, and a little bit of data or color around what happened, wait to see what direction they want to go in. Of course, we're going to have all the details with us, which is point four. We're going to have every conceivable detail that they would, they would want to know about with us when we're in the meeting. But we're going to wait for them to steer the direction in terms of, uh, of what additional detail they would like. And nine times out of 10, if we cover the first three points, nine times out of 10, that's enough. But it's that 10% it's that variable of, uh, of, of each individual's preference for the detail they like to see that we need to cover. So case study number four is the presentation that said nothing. We worked with a head of internal audit that would just just stuff his PowerPoints with all kinds of data. It would just be loaded to the brim with, uh, with lots of detailed information. Most of that information was marginally relevant. The audit committee would nod and listen politely. And then during the breaks, they would kind of pull us aside and say, so uh, what's really going on? What, you know, what's, the, what's the gist here of what we need to know? The bottom line is they were hungry for a professional opinion. And sadly, they were not getting that professional opinion. Hey, Michael, so on the screen, uh, yeah. I'm, I just want to interrupt you here, and I apologize. But 
we uh, we are getting some um, some questions from the audience. And is this a good enough time to ask you uh, a couple here? Why not? Beautiful. So uh, one of them is uh, from an audience member who's just saying, you know, when giving recommendations based on their findings, they've they've had an experience with not only department managers but also the executives overseeing the department that saw those recommendations as a challenge to their authority in the sense that they felt that, you know, this auditor was saying that they knew more about the business than they did themselves who were running the business. How would you recommend communicating, you know, recommendations without offending those people or persons? You know what? It's an excellent point, and if you don't mind, we address this exact point and concept in sin number six, negotiation. So I'd like to I'd like to hold my answer until I get to, to sin number six. And Carlo, if you could just remind me when we get there, if I happen to forget. Will do. And uh, we will leave uh, one of the other questions around this as well back to uh, sin number six. So I'll let I'll leave the floor. All right. Sounds great. Ineffective communication on the screen in front of us. I have a very ineffective audit committee slide, or this could be even an executive update slide. You can see the beginning, you know, they're talking about related party transactions, then they skip the intercompany accounts, then the finance director didn't do something, and then the, the corporate controller didn't approve a payment of $50,000, so it kind of hops around all over the place. The way I would present this slide, and the way most effective chief audit executives would present that slide, would be something like this. Unit A has one serious issue and a few minor ones. Most critical are the related party transactions. And this occurred due to second level managers. There's the detail regarding the IT manager's relationship with the supplier. The unit's been reminded about their responsibility and management has prepared the required disclosure. So this is what happened. This is why it happened. Here's the detail. This is what's been done about it. Kind of wraps up the issue very, very nicely. And now you're prepared to deal with, deal with the curveballs, as I like to say, right? We, we shouldn't be concerned when, when giving data about communicating the base level of data because that, that should be something that we should just do effectively as, as I think is done on this slide. What we really need to do is, is free ourselves uh, to deal with some of the oddball questions that might come at us. And I think having a good formula like this is going to, is going to help us accomplish that. Another polling question, Carla. Thank you, uh, Michael. And uh, this will be our second of three polling questions. And everyone should be seeing this momentarily on their screens. And just a, uh, a note that for those of you in today's audience who are after CPE credit, you will need to answer all three of our polling questions. At this time, I also want to remind you to, to continue to ask questions in our question box within the GoToWebinar panel. And we will uh, interject and interrupt uh, Michael where we see fit. And if not, we will save those questions during our Q&A session. And I'll just give everyone uh, a few more uh, seconds here to answer the uh, on-screen polling question. And we'll go ahead and share the results. Michael, while I give those folks a, a few more minutes here, um, there was one question that came in a little bit earlier, and, and unfortunately, I did not get a chance to uh, ask it. But could you give just a, a brief uh, overview on there's a, a person in the audience who's just starting from scratch and, and building up the audit function for a financial com financial services company. What do you think is the biggest risk for the function um, in being established? So which ones of the sins would have a greater impact than others? Well, uh, again, two-part question. The risk to, uh, to the audit, uh, I think your biggest risk is going to be establishing your credibility and your independence. Uh, you know, whenever you have a, uh, a startup internal audit function, which is, you know, I, I, I've been there, I've done that, I've started up an internal audit function, one of the critical things that you're going to have to do is actively market the internal audit function and really establish you know, what the internal audit function is and what it is not. Because unfortunately, a lot of people come from other companies, a lot of people come from other places, and everybody brings their baggage with them when it comes to internal audit. Some of that baggage is good baggage. If they've had great experiences with internal audit in the past, some of that baggage is a lot of negative stuff. So you really want to say, look, I know that 
internal audit is defined as lots of different things in lots of different places, but here at company A or bank A, this is the way we're defining our internal audit department. This is the way that we're going to approach internal audit. And I would say that the corollary to that, the, the, the secondary risk is you have to have a good plan from the get-go. Thank you for that, uh, Michael. And I just want to share with the audience and, and you just to kind of get your 30-second feedback on uh, the results here. And you should be seeing that here on your screen now. Anything pop out to you? Well, they're definitely not a, uh, our audience is definitely not a fan of trial by fire, and ne neither am I, so that's good. It got, uh, it got zero percent. Uh, Carla, I just want to ask you, do we have about nine minutes left before we have to wrap up for Q&A? Uh, yeah, we have about another 10 to 12 minutes uh, of time here, and, and we, as we ask questions, you know, we can eat up into the Q&A, so um, we, we definitely want to get you to finish off here. Okay. Okay, and I do agree with the audience, 52%, mix up the teams with more experienced and less experienced people. Always good. Okay, political science. So the word politics and political has a very dirty connotation to it, very bad connotation to it in our society. Uh, what we're talking about here is not mudslinging, it's not office gossip, it's not standing around the water cooler and saying, you know, who... Uh, uh, who said what about whom and, and what it meant and, and, uh, and so forth. It's the classical definition of politics. And we'll get that from where else but Wikipedia. Let me see if I can advance the slide here. There we go. The Wikipedia definition is the classical one. So politics is a process by, by which groups of people make decisions. Groups of people making decisions. Politics has been observed in all human interactions, including corporate, academic, and even religious institutions. And furthermore, politics is the process and the, uh, by which people use to formulate and apply policy. So a couple of things here. The way we make decisions and the way we formulate and apply policy. So why should we care? Well, we're internal audit. We're interested in enacting positive change within our organizations. And anyone that's interested in enacting positive change has to understand how decisions are made and what methods uh, our organization uses to formulate and apply policies. And that's important because we need to make sure that the improvements that we seek to make within our, within our organizations that the, uh, the recommendations or the, uh, um, uh, well, I guess lack of a better word, the, the improvements, once again, that, uh, that we've developed with management actually stick for the long term. Actually, I had a, uh, a mentor at one time, a professional mentor, and I think he summed it up pretty well. He said, you know, Michael, if you understand the politics of an organization, you can get a lot done. And the reverse of that is also true. If you don't understand the politics, you're just not going to be very effective. So how can we understand the, the, the decision-making process within our organization? Well, we need to ignore conventional wisdom, such as, well, the CEO is always the most powerful person, and he's the top decision-maker. Or HR clearly will make any and all decisions that have to do with people within this company. We need to open our eyes and actually observe the decision-making process in action. And then we need to follow the decision even after it's made. And the key here is if we can do this, we'll be able to formulate workable solutions to business issues that are going to get implemented. And once again, I have, uh, I have one of my uh, little formulas that I like to use for evaluating the political environment or the decision-making environment within an organization. So first, where are the decisions made? In what forum? Are they made at the CEO's weekly staff meeting? Are they made at the twice per year gathering of the 50 top managers within the company? Are they made at the quarterly business review meetings? So we, we, need, a, we need a location. Where are they made? Who makes the decision? Is it always the highest ranking individual? Is it always the head of the functional area where the decision is, uh, is manifested, so to speak? 
empower decisions made? Are they made through consensus? Does everyone sit around the table and and uh, somebody will suggest someone, something, and before the decision is made, everybody has to agree to it. Is it made through ratification? Do the uh, subordinates suggest something to their boss, and then the boss has to ratify that or agree to it? Or is it made by declaration? The boss says, we're going to do X, and that's what we do. We do X. Four is something that a lot of people, uh, I think, miss, which is who ignores the decisions and gets away with it? And clearly, this, this, I don't say this with a, with a negative connotation, but you know, there are times when, uh, when decisions have to be overturned or when, when decisions have to be you know, not implemented for a for certain reason because, quite frankly, we make decisions every day in the business world. Not all of them are going to be good decisions. So an example of this would be the CEO stands in front of his direct reports and says, you know, I say we're going to implement policy A. And the head of the largest division raises his hand and says, Mr. CEO, that's a great idea and it's wonderful and I'm sure it'll work very well, but policy A is just not going to work for my division and here's some specific reasons why it would be detrimental to the entire company to implement policy A. And five is an addendum to point four, which is, you know, who pulls the plug on a bad decision and how long after the fact? And generally, uh, the longer, the longer after a decision is made that it's overturned, you, that gives you a pretty good idea for how influential the person is. If they overturn a long-standing policy or a long-standing decision, they are likely to have significant clout within the organization. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip over uh, case study number five, uh, or maybe I'll just go through it in a, in a high level of detail. But it is, a, it is a story of a CEO calling the head of internal audit into his office and saying, I want you to do a post-implementation review of a system we just put in. The head of internal audit salutes and says, yes, sir, I'll get right on that. He contacts the president of the largest division and says, I'm coming to do the audit. The president of the largest division says, now is not the best time. I have some serious business issues, some serious customer issues that I'm dealing with, and this audit is going to be disruptive and actually could threaten some of the critical things that we're trying to achieve. Head of internal audit says, uh, I'm going to proceed as planned. I am not going to postpone this audit. And the CEO calls a few days later and berates the head of internal audit, who's very shocked and says, but I was just doing what you told me to. And the CEO, of course, responds, yes, but I expect you to exercise business judgment. I expect you to circle back with me and inform me that my largest division, who I'm counting on uh, for business performance this year, is going through some, some critical issues. So yes, perform the audit, but you know, let's use common sense here. Inability to negotiate, and here is where we will uh, address the questions that came up earlier. First, why do we have to negotiate? Aren't we the internal auditors, the risk and control experts? Shouldn't we just say something and have the business unit adopt what we say because we, of course, are risk and control experts? Well, negotiation is, in fact, a big part of our job, and it is a big part of our job because we deal with business problems. We deal with process and control issues, and those are business problems. And any business problem is going to have more than one solution. So we are the experts, but we certainly have to take into account the view of others. And none other than Richard Chambers, president of the IIA, tells us it starts with relationships. We are in a service function. We do not, we do not subordinate our judgment, but we do, in fact, serve. I think this is one of the one of the hardest areas for an internal auditor to pick up because frankly I don't think negotiation can be taught I think it can only be experienced and in fact moderation in business requires a vast database of prior experiences to be able to draw on to know when to stand stand firm and when to compromise and the best I think the best metaphor I can come up here 
I can come up with here is the stalk of wheat. You need to be able to bend with the wind, but then snap back and regain your rigidity when you need to. If you're too stiff, you'll be broken, and too soft, you'll be trampled on. So how exactly do we do this? And I want to address the prior question of we suggest things, and senior management takes it as an affront to them, and they think we're dictating what they should be doing. So the first thing I think we, we should try to do here is to focus on the end goal and not the specific path on how to get there. So we should, we can come up with recommendations, but we should make clear to the business unit that, well, here's one way you can do it, but you know what, Mr. Business Unit Head, Mr. Executive, we are extremely interested in your views on how you think this problem could be solved. And that gets to the third bullet point in the tips column, with, which is, we need to make the other side work. We need to demand suggestions, because frankly, they do know the business better than us. Frankly, they do know the process better than us. We can suggest things to them. We can guide them as risk and control experts. But they should not be a, a passive participant in this process at all. Another tip here is we need to make negotiation a part of career development, either for ourselves or for our subordinates. A trap here is compromising on the wrong issue. We don't compromise on any legal, moral, or ethical issue. Point blank, red line, we don't compromise on those things. Another trap here is, uh, and I'll speak to my friends that come from an external audit environment. Very often when you come from external audit, you are, you're used to auditing financial statements. The balance sheet says 100, it should say 90. Not a lot of negotiation that needs to go on there. It's either fairly stated or it's not. Management, are you going to make the, the adjustment or are you not going to make the adjustment? Unfortunately, when you start talking about purchasing controls, when you start talking about you know, the best way to set up system access, there are a lot of ways that you can do that, and the answers are rarely black and white. So we, we really need to, to make sure that those coming in from external audit get a uh, Get, get a good grasp on exactly what it is we're trying to achieve in internal audit. I'm watching the time, so I'm going to skip over case study six and go to destroying credibility, which is a pretty important point. Credibility far and away, and this, this addresses the, uh, the person that's setting up a new internal audit function at the financial services company. Credibility is your biggest asset. If you don't have credibility, you don't have anything. And why is that? Our entire profession is based on the concept of an independent assessment. If an independent assessment wasn't required, the company could go get somebody from FP&A or the controllers group and say, hey, you're a special projects team. Go out to a couple of the units. Go out, audit this process. Tell me if the controls are in place and report back to me. What makes internal audit so special is the concept of an independent assessment. And if somebody or if the organization won't believe or doesn't want to believe your independent assessment because you have no credibility, well, then you have nothing at that point. Some ways to destroy your credibility are to act on feelings, listen to people that try to whisper in your ear and tell you things like, hey, I heard that uh, uh, Johnny Jones' business unit is really messed up. You should say something to the audit committee about it during the next meeting. Forming an opinion on data that you haven't verified. Sharing data with others around the water cooler. Yeah, I just got back from our plant in Mississippi, and, and boy, you know, the plant manager down there really doesn't know what he's doing. Ways to build up your credibility are to make judgments and voice opinions based upon facts actual audit testing and documentation, to not be swayed by or act on inside or so-called inside information. Keep audit results confidential, except those with the need to know. And don't depend on past performance. Don't depend solely on past performance. If a business unit was really messed up from a control perspective last year, you know, they may have improved things. And that's going to be borne out in the testing. And vice versa, if they were really good last year or the year before, doesn't mean they're going to be really good this year. 
Uh oh. Let's see if we can get the slide to flip here. There we go. Carlo, how are we doing on time? You've got about a, another minute or two here, Michael, and, and I apologize for getting you uh, caught up early with some questions, but uh, they were coming through and uh, we definitely wanted to get to them. It looks like we will be uh, unable to have a Q&A session. We do have some more questions in queue, uh, but I, I, uh, if you don't mind, we can uh, work with you offline and uh, have a direct response with those uh, attendees' questions. I'm happy to do that. Let me let me wrap up. Uh, let me wrap up in the next minute. I, I did skip over case study number seven, which is is, is nothing more than a story about uh, somebody whispering in the head of internal audit's ear. Fortunately, in that case, she chose not to take action on it, which was the correct choice. So now that we've discussed the seven sins, here are their antonym or their opposite, which are the seven virtues, as we call them. And you're much more familiar with these, I, I suspect, because they are nothing more than what your first business mentor probably told you. Plan effectively, integrate your activities with others, stick to the facts, communicate clearly, negotiate fair, uh, fairly, and maintain your credibility. Back to our concept of value and fit, and we'll close with this. To be successful in internal audit, we need to understand how we provide value and how this fits in with, this or, with the organization. And this actually means you have to have a solid base of technical skills for sure. You have to be able to translate that knowledge into effective solutions that others will buy into. And finally, you need to have the credibility and integrity to deliver this to the organization and have it be believed by your organization. And if we can do all of this, which is a tall order, it's going to be what separates the executives and internal audit from the managers. And with that, I think we, uh, we're all set here, Carla. Thank you uh, so much, Michael. Uh, apologies. I wish we had more time. And uh, to the audience members who have questions, we will work with Michael and uh, get them answered for you directly after today's webinar. And uh, you can see here Michael's contact information. You'll also have the uh, option to request an introduction in the post-event survey to uh, directly um, link up with Michael post the event. And uh, with that, I want to thank Michael for his time today. We really appreciate your uh, sharing the seven deadly sins and obviously the seven virtues and getting internal audit back on track to continue to deliver value and the fit. And uh, we look forward to continuing this discussion um, online at performative.com and um, we will ask you at the end, all of you, the attendees, to um, answer a short survey at the end and we truly value your feedback and appreciate your time to help us continue to deliver this great content. And like I said earlier, at that time you'll be easily uh, able to request a connection with uh, Michael at the click of your mouse. And again, if you have any questions around CPE credits, please contact Chris Brower at performative.com. I also want to take this moment to uh, give everyone uh, the opportunity to take advantage of the early bird pricing for our second annual CFO Dimensions Conference, which will be held in New York City uh, on August 21st and 22nd, with the theme around strategic leadership and finance and understanding the evolution and the next steps. Um, we uh, are going to have some real impressive world-class uh, speakers there joining us, sharing best practices and case studies, just as Michael has shared with us today. And we look forward to seeing everyone at the event. And now on to our third and final polling question. And everyone should be seeing this momentarily on their screen. And while you are answering this, we will um, ask that you just stick around for just another 30 seconds, post this, uh, this poll question, and um, answer our uh, short survey. And I'd like to take this time to thank Michael again, as well as thank you, the audience. During that short survey, you'll have a, an opportunity to request a connection with Michael and also request more information on CFO Dimensions. I'll leave this open for just a few more seconds. And uh, we hope to see you again on another performative event or online at performative.com. Have a great rest of the day, folks. Goodbye. <laughs>